Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord strengthens and protects me. I trust in him with all my heart, and I am rescued, and my heart is full of joy, and I will sing to him in gratitude. We don't wait till Sunday to sing a praise unto the Lord. But if we're going to be in here today, this morning, let's sing a praise unto the Lord together. Amen. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Lord today and we won't be quiet we 
we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. But now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it out. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted. Redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord be praised. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out Your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. For anybody who feels bound or stuck, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You can feel bound and stuck for lots of reasons. We know that sin bounds you, but we also know that anxiety and depression and sadness and worry and heartache can bound you too. It can bind you because it doesn't allow you to freely live out what God is calling you to live out. And so there are things that we need to let go of, which we know it's not always easy to do. But if the word of God tells me that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, then you need to recognize the spirit of God in a place You need to recognize the Spirit of the Lord in a place so that you can free yourself of things that are holding you back to live life and life in abundance. And you know what the biggest wall, the biggest wall between you and experiencing and recognizing the Spirit of God. It's you. It's yourself. Free yourself from yourself. 
to experience the spirit of the Lord so that you can be free. You don't have to put up a front. You don't have to try to be sh- look strong on the outside. You don't have to pretend and put on a mask. You just free yourself and let the spirit of God have that encounter with the spirit of God so he can move and he can work and he can touch and he can heal and he can mend and he can free where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom Spirit of the Lord is there.
where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord to tell you and the world tries to convince you that belonging to God and having Jesus as your Lord and Savior restricts you. But there is so much freedom. There is more freedom in Christ than there is anywhere else. The world tries to convince you and the world tries to tell you that following God and following Christ there's too many rules there's too many do's and don'ts, but there's only one thing that he wants, which is your heart. And he says, love me, love yourself, love your neighbor. He's a God who loves. And when you choose him, and when you love yourself, and when you love him, and when you love your neighbor, and those things are imprinted in your heart, you don't need all of the do's and don'ts because it's in you to love him and love one another and love yourself and there's freedom in that you don't have to hide and he begins to show you and he begins to minister to you and he his will your will begins to line up with his will and then you walk the path that he's put before you and there's freedom in that Ever since I was a little girl, they used to call me Butterfly because I was so free. I was always so free and so daring. I was traviesa and I would do this and do that. And, and I hated restrictions and I, I, was, I would dress how I wanted to dress and be how I wanted to be. And freedom was important to me. Justice is important to me. But when I truly, truly found God for myself, I found true freedom. And I didn't, don't care what anybody thinks, what anybody says. I love God. I know who He is. I know what He can do. I know His power. I've seen His hand in my life. I've seen Him save me and rescue me. And I've seen Him teach me. And I've seen Him guide me. And I've seen Him protect me and love me. And I've seen Him teach me lessons. And I've seen Him grow me. I've seen Him do all these things. And I have freedom in Him. Because if I'm not here tomorrow, I've got him. Because if I'm not here tomorrow, I belong to him. Why? Because I choose to belong to him while I'm here right now. I'm yours and you're mine. And there's freedom in that. Where the spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom And where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Hallelujah. We thank you, God, and we 
thank you, Holy Spirit, for being in this room. And I pray that hearts and minds are open to receive what you have, what more you have for us today. Father God, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for leaving the comforter and the helper for us to encounter and to receive and to empower us and to touch us and to teach us and to guide us. We thank you that you are in this room and that you are in this place. Let there be peace. Let there be joy. Let there be a sound mind open to receive all that you have for us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give God a hand of praise this morning. Thank you, God. As we move into our time of giving, which is also part of our worship, we want to pray for everything that's come into the house and that's coming into this house. As Pastor and I, we had a meeting the other day and we started to chart all of the different areas and all the different things that come out of this house and how small maybe we may be in comparison to other maybe ministries and in number and in size, how big the things God does from this house. It's amazing. We thank you, God. Lord, that we know that you have us in your hand and that you continue to provide and to support us and to just have your hand in everything that we do, that you are the head of this house. We thank you, God. Lord, we pray for everything that comes in today. Father God, we bless those that are giving. We pray bless those that are giving offering, that are giving tithe, Lord. We bless those that give and we bless everything that comes in, that it continues to advance your kingdom and that we place it in your hand for us to continue to grow and move in power and move in might in this area and in this time that you've called for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. There's many ways to give. There's um, some QR codes on the chairs. You can give electronically. You can give in-house. We have people here um, with the baskets, but you can give. But let's just do this joyfully and with a good heart and trusting and knowing that God's doing big and great things in this house. Amen. Good morning, family. How we doing? Amen, amen. Glad, 
Glad to see everyone here. If you're capable and you're able to move up towards the front, please, we didn't expand this church so everybody can just go to the back and not be up here with me. Uh, so if you're able, make your way this way. I know some people have carriages and stuff like that. But if you're able to come this way, come on up. Let's fill up this, this house up here. Um, I don't know. It's just whenever I go to church, I try to go to get close to the, well, they say the fire. Even though the fire is everywhere, but I like to be up close and personal. So if you can do that, come on in. Don't be afraid. Um, I only spit four rows back, so one, two, uh, yeah, you guys ain't safe. <laughs> the splash zone is up here, so so be careful. Um, this week we do have our Empower Service, right? Empower Service is this Friday. Please, please, whenever the house has something going on, please let's make a good effort to be in the house. Let's show out for that. Uh, we also have July 12th, our worship night. Yeah, it's, you have plenty of time to make arrangements, to move your schedule, but please come out. It's going to be powerful. Um, God has his hands all over that day already. I already see God doing mighty things. So please be here. Um, whenever the church doors are open, that is a time for the gathering of the saints to come in and be in unity. So it's also a display of unity when you come and support the vision of the house. And speaking of vision, um, one of these guys is probably going to kill me. Um, Ron, <laughs> somebody, anybody, can you everybody get that, that uh, the 5K poster thing that's over there? I was going to say Ron, because I asked him, I told you, Ron, what's the 5K? He's like, we have a 5K? So I was going to bust his chops with it. I'm like, what church do you go to, Ron? Um, but the 5K, basically, we have a Reflection 5K. It's on our website. It's up here. When you first walk in, you should be able to see it. And I want to talk about that just for a little bit, because that is basically the vision behind everything that we do in this church. Uh, can you guys give it up for Jimmy? Yeah. <laughs> Those online can't watch it, but he'll be in the picture any second now. Here he is to display it. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, I don't know if you want to. We could just hold it here. Just stand by somewhere. Or you want to be? You want to? You got to go work. Yeah, she's prettier than you. <laughs> I don't think he wants to be called pretty anyways. <laughs> so the Reflection 5K. Thank you, ma'am. The Reflection 5K is basically why we do what we do here at Reflection. Everything that we do, every ministry comes out of this. This is the reason why we do it. It is the reason why you're joined to this church, um, the reason why you should be joined to this church. Because it's important to know what the house vision of, of the church is. Every tribe has different uh, functions. Every tribe, when I mean tribe, in different congregations. They have different areas that they're going to impact and what God has called them to do. But here at Reflection Church, off the top, we want you to, to know God. It starts there. We want you to know God. And it's very important because the more you know about God, the more you want to know more about how you get to be in relationship with him. And the more you know about God, you actually start to know more about yourself because you're made in his image and his likeness. So Jesus introduces himself to, he introduces himself to you and then he introduces you to you. And the more you look at him, you should be more a reflection of him. So the, again, the more you know of God, the more you're actually going to know about yourself. So once you know God, you're like, God, how do, how, how, do, how do I enter in? How do I become a part of your family? And that's knowing his kingdom. Because the point that Jesus came here on earth was to set order for his kingdom to be set here on earth. He said the very first thing he said when he launched his ministry was repent for the kingdom is at hand. Yeah. So that was so important for him because it was the first words that came out of his mouth. And every, most of the parables and the kingdom is like and the kingdom is like and the kingdom is like. So once you know God and know what he has for you, you'll be like, what does that look like? He's going to tell you, it is the kingdom. This is why you could go to a church, and it's happened to me. I was in a good church for seven years, and more than that, until finally I heard the message of the kingdom. Because it got to a point where I was like, is this it? Come to church on Sunday, do Bible studies, do worship nights, and that is it? There's got to be more to this. Because I've been doing this for a long time, and I feel like there's more. Have you ever felt like there's more? Even within the church, you feel like this got to be more. It can't just be this right here. And that's the kingdom gives you that because the kingdom gives you the structure for what else you need in this life. He says, seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. So he put an order, a priority of what you should be doing first, which is seeking the kingdom and its righteousness, which is the structure. And once you have that, you know freedom. We talked about liberty and freedom during worship today. There is no freedom and there's no liberty without knowing the structure of the kingdom. 
Once you know the righteousness, once you know how to operate within the kingdom, you will actually be free. And like Pastor Tani was saying, it's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's just by putting things in order and you, you get the freedom. Jesus didn't come here to keep you captured and keep you bound. He actually came here so you can just run wild in this earth. And I mean wild in a good way, proclaiming his good name. Not run wild and do whatever you want. Run wild doing the things that he has called you to do. So that's freedom. One of my favorite movies is not The Lion King. I know you guys think it's not. It's, it's, yeah, well, Lion King's one of the top five on, for me. But I have no order. But in, in, in no order, uh, Braveheart is one of my favorite movies. I don't know why. I just love movies when, when the heroes die. If you haven't watched Braveheart, I'm sorry that I ruined it for you. It's been out for forever. If you haven't watched it by now, then something's wrong with you. Repent for the kingdom's at hand. And at the end of the movie, <laughs> he has every movie in the world in his house. So I might see it. At the end of the movie, he dies. He dies. He gets killed. And he yells freedom right before he gets killed. And Jesus was the same way. And Jesus said, you know, they said, Pontius Pilate told me, I got the power to take your life. He says, you don't have the power to do that. I give my life freely. See, when we live free in the kingdom, we know that no one can take our lives, even if they take our physical lives. Because we know where we're going. We know there's more than just to this world. We know there's a heaven. We know that there's another plan outside of this earth for God. We know that when we leave here, we're in his presence. We know these things. So if you know those things, why would you stay bound to the things of this earth? Knowing that all the things in this earth are just temporary. This too shall come to pass. Everything here is dying and fleeing away. But are you invested in treasures in heaven? Is your life committed to the kingdom? Because that's where the true freedom is at. That no matter what comes, persecution, trials, and tribulations, those things can't hold you. You can yell freedom when those things come. If you truly know who you are in God and know about his kingdom. So once you know freedom, you actually start to begin to know your purpose. You know what your purpose is. How many times you, you've gone through this world? I've went through a, a period. I don't know what my purpose is in life. And there's people within the church that still say, I still don't know what my purpose is. You're not going to find your purpose in a book. Well, this book you will. Not in a no self-help book. You're not going to find your purpose in, in, a, in a horoscope. A motivational speaker, if he's not speaking from God's point of view. Let's go back to horoscope. The thing says horror. You're not going to find your, pur your purpose inside of horror. <laughs> Somebody had to hear it. So once you know your purpose, you're actually pointed into your destiny. Once you know your purpose, and if you remain within your purpose, you know exactly where you're heading. You know exactly where you're going. You know exactly how to get there. Because God is the one that sets order. He is the one that, that sets the road and puts the light on, on, on your feet for you to walk in that purpose. And it says narrow is the way. Narrow is the way of the righteous. Narrow is the way of the people that follow God. But those that don't, the, the road is wide. You can go wherever you want. But God places an order and places your steps. He orders your steps. He anoints your steps. But you have to be in step with God. How do you do that? By knowing him. You go back to the top. You know him. You know his kingdom. You know his standards. You know his righteousness. You know that you're set free. Because how many times have we heard that you've been set free, but you still feel like you're bound? Because what actually happens is, yeah, we, you good. <laughs> what actually happens, no. Nah. What actually happens is this. You're in a cage. You're captive. Here comes Jesus and breaks the cage open, busts the door open, takes the shackles off you, but he does not force you to leave the comfort of the cage. He orders your steps. So now it is your, uh, your job to walk it out, to walk out the steps. He gives you the ability through his word to move forward. And by doing that, 
you become a witness of God's power here on the earth. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to be in Hebrews for as long as God wants us there. And we're going to go verse for verse, starting in chapter 1. Thank you, Jesus, for the reading of your word. And those that believe in your word, shout amen. Amen. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. So he's saying here that in times, there was various times that he would speak unlike the way he speaks now. Now we have the ability to hear from God once you're saved and the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Because once you, once you accept Jesus as Lord, that is part of the promise that the Holy Spirit now comes and dwells with you. So before that, he would speak directly to prophets. He will speak to certain people that will lead over the people, and there will be the mouthpiece of God. Moses was that mouthpiece. Noah was that mouthpiece. All the prophets that you read, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all those guys were mouthpiece. Then came John the Baptist, another mouthpiece. And then Jesus came, died on that cross for the sins, for our transgressions, and then he deposits his own spirit, his Holy Spirit inside of every single person here. So now every single person here has the ability to hear directly from God. His word says that his sheep know his voice and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. So all you have to do is evaluate your life and see what you're following to know who is the master of your life or who is the Lord of your life. If you're walking into areas that you know God has not called you to be in there, then you need to recognize what voice is the loudest voice in my life. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. So he is saying at this time, this is, this is in Hebrews, this is this Paul, these, are, these guys are still around. They have witnessed God and, and they've seen Jesus. And he's saying at this time, Jesus himself was here and we heard directly from him. And that's how God spoke to us. We had direct access to him here on the earth. And he spoke of these words. He spoke of his father. He spoke of his kingdom. Has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And to let you know right now, he is still speaking by his son through the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit just gives witness of who Jesus was and is. And is to come. The Holy Spirit's job is not to come with a different gospel or a different message. The Holy Spirit comes here to confirm the works of Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ died for and what he's trying to do in your life today. But do you know his voice? Whom he appointed, the Father appointed him, heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Just stop right there. Made the worlds. When we read in John 3, 16, it says that for God so loved the world. That word world there is, is the cosmos, is everything that was created. It is the cosmos. It is the also government, structure. God so loved the world that he died. He loved the, his structure so much that he died for it. And within that structure, you're supposed to live in it. Because if he would have came here just to die for you because he loved you, we would have still been in trouble without the structure that he would laid out. If he just comes and just dies for you but doesn't set order and reintroduce you to the original structure, then we still go back and keep doing the same things. But he's like, I got to get the structure inside of them so that they can receive it and walk freely the way they were intended to walk in their purpose. I see you guys should look at yourselves the way you're looking at me right now. And he appointed heir of all things. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was appointed heir of all things. And then the Bible tells us that we are co-heirs with Christ. This is why I tell you, the more you know him, the more you know about yourself. yourself. And the more you know what he has, the more you know it is for you also to obtain. He appointed all things. Through him, he also made the worlds. 
This word worlds is different from the word worlds that means cosmos. This, world, this word world here means, I know it's a tongue twist, too many, they put an L there and it messes me up. This word world means eternity. Eternity. So everything from day one to eternal past, eternal future, everything belongs to him and he is the one that rules over it. Through him also he made the world. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word is God. And nothing was made without the word. And everything that was made was through the word. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. We go to Genesis. And he said, let there be light. Everything he created was through the word. So every time God the Father was speaking, he was actually putting his son out into the atmosphere. And as his son went out into the atmosphere, the Holy Spirit would grab that thing and start creating. Because it says in Genesis that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And every time he said, let there be, the Spirit moved, and it was so. Next verse. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. This is amazing here. Because we have God the Father. We have the Word, because that's who his son is, the Word. He doesn't become Jesus until he is born on the earth. Jesus is his, 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 his name here on earth, but in heaven he is known as the Word. In the Bible it says there's still three that give testimony in heaven. It is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. So we see here that he became flesh and became the express image of his person. Does that not seem or sound similar? The same way he created mankind, the same way when he created Adam, he said, let us make man in my image and likeness. So the same thing he did with Adam and for all of us, he had to do the same thing with Jesus. Why? Because Adam transgressed. Adam sinned. So in order to overcome sin, it had to be done with a man. So, yes, Jesus came into this earth 100% man. Because if he came 100% only God, then, of course, he will easily beat sin. Because he didn't even have to go through all that stuff. All he had to say, just speak the word, and sin would be done. But he follows his own laws, and he follows his own commands. And once Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, sin entered the world, and now power was given over to Satan. It says in the Bible, the ruler of this earth. He has legal authority to do certain things. But he does not have the power to touch the children of God. But the only time he can touch us is when we come into agreement with what he's doing in our lives or he's trying to do in our lives. The only time Adam and Eve were able to be touched by sin is when they listened to the serpent. He was there, but he couldn't do anything. He was there. I don't know for how long he was there for, but he was around. But it wasn't until they started to listen to him and obey what he said. It wasn't until then that sin had the authority to come into people's lives. So Jesus had to come in the form of a man. The word had to come in the form of a man because it was a man who broke the law. So it had to be a man to restore the law. But it had to be a man in perfection. Who being the brightness of his glory. How have we been talking about glory? So he is saying here, the brightest form of glory is his son. But what makes him the brightest form of glory? Express image of his person and upholding. All things by the word of his power. This is how we go from glory to glory. This is how we are supposed to express God's image here on the earth. When you express his image here on the earth, you're actually displaying glory. Because everything Jesus is and was and is going to be 
we are also partakers of that. Back to Genesis. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. Back here, his glory and express image of his person. You're supposed to be his twin brother and sister. When they see you, they should see Jesus. When they see you, they should see the father because Jesus looks like his daddy. We're supposed to be the express. And we say, God, let your glory come. God, do this. And God is saying, I already did that. I already did that, and I passed it on to you. We're here crying, Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Jesus is here. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Your the Holy Spirit is here. How much more power do we need here on the earth if it's already here? And upholding all things, this is where we get in trouble. We uphold some things. Or we don't uphold all things because we don't know what the all things are. How do we know all things? By knowing God. Seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness. That's how you gain the Bible says my people, he said his people, my people perish for lack of knowledge. But my people, I'm going to give you another translation. My people perish for lack of light. My people perish for lack of revelation. He's saying his people. He ain't talking about the people that are not his. He's saying my people if they remain ignorant, they perish. And upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name, name than they. This can confuse some people sometimes. Hey, he's the word. Yes, but the word came off the throne to come down here. So at that moment, he's 100% man, having 100% human experience, being tempted by the same things we're tempted. But we know the story. He overcame every single temptation. And because he overcame every single temptation, guess what? You have no excuse. You have no excuse to overcome any temptation. There is no temptation in this earth that that's, can overcome us. Why? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. Because Jesus overcame it. So Jesus laid out the blueprint. If you know me and you know my kingdom and practice righteousness, upholding all the things I've told you, there is no sin, there is no temptation that can overcome you. This is good news. Uh, having become so much better than the angels. So at that point, uh, let me teach a little bit. There is a scripture in the Old Testament, and it says that he has, became, he has made you him lower. He says, what if man, that you made him a little lower than the angels? In the Old Testament Hebrew word, angels, they, they didn't translate too well into the English. That word angels in the Old Testament, the Hebrew language, is actually Elohim. But those ever studied the word, Elohim is God. So we think he made him a little lower than the angels. The angels, you know, the ones with the, with the little wings and the little feeding grapes and all that. Made him a little lower than himself. So he took, yeah, I don't got time to unpack this, but God himself, Jesus is the word in heaven, chose to come down from his position and make himself a little lower. And it says, what is man? What is man? That's what the angel was saying. What is man that you made him like? That you, you, you're after them, that you love them so much. And that you, he, they were talking about 
mankind at the, in that scripture. They were talking about how you've made them a little lower than God. He was talking about mankind. So in the order of the kingdom, there is God the Father, there's the, 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 the Godhead, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then it's you. He has made us a little lower. But with the same abilities, because he shares everything that he has. We're co-heirs with Christ. We're partakers of all things that he has and the ability that he has. But if we don't know who he is, we don't know who we are, and we'll stay and remain bound and locked into our own thinking. When God has come to set you free. So here we are, and he's saying, have become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance. So in this scripture here, yes, he is talking about the angels, the, the spiritual beings in this portion here. Because the angels are completely 100% spiritual. But for a moment in time, a moment in eternity, God chose to come down to, to earth and put himself in time. So he was limited and what he can do compared to what he used to be able to do in the, from, the, from the, the spiritual realm. He was bound to a body like we are. He became just, just like you and I. That is a beautiful thing. Because in every other culture, and every other religion, their God does not die for them. Their God gives them a bunch of rules and regulations and orders and stuff like that that keeps them bound. But our God leaves his throne. What king leaves his throne to die for his people? Leaves his throne. Listen, he left perfection to come to a dying world. To die. I hope this is hitting home. As he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. This is why we can say Jesus the name. Above all names. This is why you, when you call out his name, like Minister Christian says, it demands a response. The name of Jesus is a name that demands response. Go to a store today and just say, Jesus. Either somebody else is going to say hallelujah, somebody's going to be like, oh, here we go again, he's Christian. Uh, or somebody might just curse you out. But it's going to demand a response. And it's interesting that Jesus is the only, for the sake of, of, is the only religious name, a religious figure that people reject. You might not believe in Muhammad. The world might not believe in Muhammad, but they don't fight him back. But the moment you say we want Jesus in the schools, oh, oh we can't do that. But let's set Muhammad up. All right, you know, we got to respect people's. The fact that you see that, that, that clashing tells me there's something about the name of Jesus that they don't want. There must be power in that name that you're trying to stop it. There must be something wrong with their thinking because everything else is acceptable. You can say, let's worship a leprechaun. People are like, hey, that's what they want to believe in. Amen. Let them go right ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. <laughs> you can say whatever. And people are like, hey, you know, you got to respect people's feelings. But the moment you say Jesus, nah, we don't got to respect that one. That tells me there is something I need to look a little closer why people don't want to accept, well, I don't have to look anymore, but if you're, you're debating, oh, if, should, I, should I read about this? Should I read about that? Should I read about that? Read about Jesus and that's it. There is a reason why demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Try any other name. They might just start dancing with you. I forgot, we had a conversation the other day, people praying to, to stones and, 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 and marbles and all types, cows, yeah, all types of stuff. Saints. I 
I'm not feisty this morning. I'm just <laughs> trying to just tell you. Just trying to tell you. As he by her is a greater name. Jesus, the, all right, next verse. I'm going to go quickly through these here. Matter of fact. For to which of the angels did you ever say, you are my son? Today I have begotten you, and again, I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Things a family affair. But when he, again, brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about his son. I want you to capture all this because the last verse in this chapter is going to should blow your mind. But to the sons, to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Anybody know what a scepter is? Except there's, there's the, you know, what the king holds and boom. He's saying that is, righteousness is the scepter of the king. You can't get away from righteousness if you are a kingdom citizen and you know it. Because the moment you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, yes, you're born again. Yes, you're a citizen. But do you know you're a citizen? Because whatever country you're born into will determine what rights you have. All right. So what I'm saying is there are rights that belong to you, but if you don't know that, you are not going to receive them or operate according to it. And there's also rights that you know that right now you are crossing the line and breaking the law. There was a pastor, I'm not going to mention any names, who stepped down. There's more and more every day stepping down. There was a prophetic word earlier this year, it wasn't with me. It said that God is cleaning house. I like when God cleans house. He does that when he prunes the tree because it promotes growth. And there's a pastor who stepped down himself, stepped down. Because he said he committed a sin and he holds the church to the standard, the standard of the kingdom. So he has to hold himself to the standard as well. But the thing that bothered me was this. He said, I committed a sin, but I didn't commit a crime. So what he is saying is, I didn't commit a crime according to the laws of this land. But the fact that you committed a sin means you committed a crime in heaven. So I need you to identify with the crimes that you commit against heaven. Those are the ones that determines your eternal future. Those are the ones that Jesus died for. Yes, we respect the law of the land, but the law, don't be afraid of the law of the land if you're breaking the ones in heaven. Oh, oh don't be, okay, I'm keeping the laws of the land. I'm keeping all the laws of the land but I don't recognize the ones from heaven. See, whatever, wherever you're born, that's where you are, your citizenship lies. And those laws are the ones that you follow. When you're born of the world, follow those laws. When you're born of the kingdom, follow the kingdom. Because the word says that Jesus is the king of all kings. So in other words, Jesus is, is, is the ruler even over your president. So his kingdom is greater than all the kingdoms of the earth. How do I know that? Because he is the name that's above all names. So God doesn't care about your Democratic Party, your Republican Party, your nonpartisan party. He doesn't care about any party. All he cares about is a Holy Ghost party. That's who you belong to. Are you following those laws? Are you following? The laws of the kingdom is called this, righteousness. Right standing. Are you in right standing with your kingdom? A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. This is the father talking about his son. Who's his son? Jesus. The word. 
You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. If we're supposed to be a direct representation, an image, an express image and likeness of who God is and who Jesus is and what he represented here on earth, then we better hate the same thing he hates and love the same thing he loves. It says, you have loved righteousness. Jesus hates. Jesus hates. He hates all things that are not righteous. And that hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, capital Y, so it's talking about Jesus still, you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. But again, I say to you, aren't we co-heirs of Christ? So everything that the Father did for the Son should land on us at some point. Go back a verse. The beginning of that verse. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you. Why did he anoint it? Remember when it says therefore? It's basically telling us what the verse before that was there for. Why was that? He was there. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. Why was he anointed? Because he loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And what did he anoint them with? With the oil of gladness. Some of y'all need some gladness in your life right about now. So can we tie these two together? That sometimes we don't get to that place of gladness. We don't get to that place that we say, I feel blessed, because blessed means happy. Could it be that there's some laws that you're just breaking that doesn't allow the oil to flow? Didn't we talk about this, was it last week, that... How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And it talks about how the oil is supposed to flow down, but you can hinder that oil. Because we're a body, the body of Christ. And all it takes is one person to be out of alignment. And now the oil that's supposed to go straight down like this has to stop because there's nowhere, something is hindering it and stopping it from continuing to go down. And God is saying here, love righteousness. And you'll be anointed because he anointed the son. Yes, he's talking to the son. But when the son died on the cross and we receive him as Lord and Savior, guess what we become? Sons. Jesus died so he can multiply. The word is a seed. God the Father spoke the word down onto the earth and it came in the form of flesh named Jesus. The seed came in and it died upon a tree so it can multiply. He planted him here on earth so that you and I can walk in righteousness. And we say, oh, you know, we got to pursue happiness and we got to be glad and we got, yes, God has a formula for that. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Love righteousness. You'll be glad. You ever see somebody who you know they follow the Lord? But you know that they're going through some stuff. They're in many storms, but you will never tell because they remain glad. They remain with joy. How many know that the joy of the Lord is our strength? Joy is a substance. It's not a feeling. It's a state of being. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Verse 10. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. He's talking about the word. He's talking about Jesus. This is what he did. They, they will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same. Why do we keep running as a, we're hard-headed. Why do we keep running to things that are not consistent? Why do we keep running to, to things that change? From the beginning of the foundations of the earth, Jesus has been the same. Our Father has been the same. The Holy Spirit has been the same. How many people do you know that have a reputation like that? 
or how many things that we rely upon. Is our, some people rely on the stock market. That goes up and down. We rely on our jobs. You could be laid off tomorrow. But guess what? Jesus still remains God even if you're laid off or employed. And they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand? Sit at my right hand. This is important to know because some religions believe that Jesus is an angel. They say, oh, he was Michael. He's the same. The Bible, your word says he's always been the same. So how is he going to be Michael one day and Jesus another day and Julio another day? No, he's the same. But to which of the angels have you said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Keep it right there. Because I've been saying over and over again that whatever Jesus has, we have. So he's saying here, sit at my right hand. If you read your Bible, there's a portion, there's a part that it says that you are seated in heavenly places. We not might be seated at the right hand of the Father like Jesus is, but we're up there sitting down right now whether you know it or not. The more you know about Jesus, the more you know about yourself. The more you know about Jesus' position, the more you know about your position here on earth. How can he tell you thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven if you don't know what heaven is doing? But I don't know what's going on in heaven. Because you haven't realized or you haven't woken up to the fact that you're already seated in heavenly places. And the moment you get in line, and the moment you start to pray, you're already connected directly with heaven. And you should be able to see exactly what heaven is doing so it could be ushered through you here on earth. Yeah. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Where is your enemy supposed to be located in your life? Come on. He's not supposed to be here where you see him eye to eye. He's not supposed to be where you look up to him. Hey, man, why are you still around? He's not alongside. No. He's not. No. He's smaller than this. Footstool. I have a footstool at home. You know what you do with a footstool? But for what reason? Come on now. You use a footstool to get elevated. So instead of looking at your enemy as a hindrance or a setback, look at him as a step up. So God will always use an enemy in your life to promote you to higher places. How do I know that? David was presented a giant, a Goliath, an enemy. And after he, 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 he hit him with the stone and took his head off, what happened to David? He was elevated and promoted. Why are we tripping on the enemy when we're called to trample the enemy? And it's not going to be by your own strength and your own power. Because, again, the reason why we have the authority to do that is because Jesus did it. And all he is saying is, I was the example. Follow my way. Then he told the disciples, hey, come follow me. That was his invitation. Follow me. I will make you this. Come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. He makes the invitation, but he doesn't force you to attend. He invites you to the wedding. But you still have to get there. Till I make your enemies your footstool. This is the last verse, right? Those are. Are they? It's talking about the angels now. Joel, help me out. Actually, help them out. But are they not all ministering spirits? He's talking about the angels. 
He is telling you right here what their job is, what they were created for. Even Satan himself was supposed to be a ministering spirit. When you disobey your purpose and what you were called to do, you will take up another image. That's what happened to Satan. His name was Jesus. God didn't call him Satan. His name was Lucifer, a light bearer. And not to get too deep into it, but Jesus was the... Why was Lucifer able to be a light bearer? Because Jesus knew about light. He is the light. So he knows a thing about light. That is his image. He is light. He bears light. He says, I am the light of the world. And if you read further down in John, he says, you are the light of the world. I hope you're making the connection here. Everything Jesus represented here on the earth, all the way down to his image and his likeness, he transferred it to us when we make him Lord of our lives. He says, I'm the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. The same power that resurrected him. Just think about that. Just think about that. He's put on a cross. He dies. He dies not because he sinned, but because he took on sin. I want you to think about this. If you were to die in sin today, or those that die because they never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and remain as sinners, where do they go when they die? So when Jesus died unjustly, but he had to because he had to overcome sin in the grave. He had to go somewhere. So for three days, Jesus wasn't on the earth. And Jesus wasn't in heaven. And he says he took the keys. And then he rose again. But how did he raise? Because the power of the Holy Spirit brought him back. Because he's a righteous judge. And he was able to see there's no righteousness here. My son don't, this doesn't deserve the penalty that the world put upon him. So the power of the Holy Spirit resurrects him. And now is placed inside of you? Let's back it up. Resurrection power is inside of you. Every time you lead somebody to the Lord, you have resurrected that person. The same way Jesus was resurrected. Every time you share the gospel, the power that brought him from the, from the grave is released into the atmosphere. Every time you walk out of your house representing your kingdom, the Holy Spirit is walking along inside of you. That's who you are. But do you love righteousness? How are you representing? Now back to the angels. They're ministering angels. But they don't minister to your unrighteousness. They minister to your righteousness. They minister to you on assignment, walking forward. They aid you when you're going on the mission field. They aid you in your destiny. They aid you on your purpose. They aid you in your calling. Angels minister to movement of the word of God. Are they not all ministering angels sent forth to minister for those who would inherit salvation? I'm just waiting for somebody to get the revelation and just shout. Because when Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights and he remained in the word in himself, 
He remained with himself. He remained in himself. He remained in his image. He remained in his likeness. He didn't take up another image or another likeness or let somebody else fool him with some words. He remained in himself. He remained true to his character. At the end of the 40 days, it said the angels came to minister to him. Where are your angels at? Your help comes from above. He says, are they not all ministering spirits? All the angels that did not fall, they're all waiting for the sons of God to rise up. And what I mean is when I say sons, you guys already know. I'm not talking about gender specific. Waiting for the sons and daughters to walk out their purpose. To be able to go through trials and tribulations and temptations, but still remain the same, planted in Christ, standing on the foundation of the Lord. They're just waiting for you not to be wishy-washy, to be double-minded. They're waiting for you to stand firm in who you say you are and who he says you are. And he's waiting to see the image and likeness to remain the same. I get excited about this because this is how you set people free. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? He talked about all these things about his son. My son this, my son that, my son this. Why was he doing that? Because he is saying, you inherit the same thing my son has. There's an army of angels waiting to be deployed on your behalf. And I'll put it this way and I'll quit. There are angels on standby looking to see if they see Jesus on the earth. And the moment they see that image and that likeness, and that likeness, they say, let's get to work with that one. Let's come alongside. Let's aid. Let's help. Have any of you ever received a breakthrough that you don't know how that happened? Could it be that your angel was deployed? and ran ahead of you because he knew you were coming, that you were on the move. That your faith was in action. Oh, don't let your faith be a reaction. What do I mean by that? Don't let something happen to say, oh, now I'm going to practice faith. Let your faith be a lifestyle. But faith only cometh by hearing the word and hearing the word of God. Thank you, Jesus, for this. Thank you for Hebrews chapter 1, my God. Thank you for laying out some things, some principles. Thank you for the keys that only come from your throne. Thank you. I pray, Lord, that your word just unlock some things in all the lives of, of, of your children here represented today continue to show us, continue to grow us in your image and your likeness so that we can be a true representation, true citizens of your great and mighty kingdom. We thank you, King Jesus, and we all say.